if you could, could you introduce EA and, and give the, um, uh, everybody an opportunity to understand the practice of emergency exit hours? Yes. Well, I suppose I would start off by talking about my own journey. Uh, I went to Dartington College of Arts, which at the time was uh, a, a, an interesting experimental place to be. I had no idea what it was about, but I went there and discovered that it wasn't about making work that was on the stage, it wasn't about um, uh, working in a very traditional sense of, of classical ballet, which was probably where I came from. Um, it was about working in lots of different contexts. So I found myself in my first year working in a psychiatric ward and using the arts to engage people who were generally under the liquid cosh. But um, the, that, was a, that was a way of, of finding a context for the skills that I was being taught uh, by, by the lecturers there. And I also found myself out uh, doing Threatening Opera to the, the local um, Navy base, which is quite a challenge. Uh, so so it, it, I suddenly started to see that the arts weren't where I thought they were always going to be, which was in the theatre and the art gallery, um, and got a taste for that, and then was very influenced by a company called Welfare State International, who at the time were uh, nomadic and travelling around Devon uh, and other places, Dartington's in Devon. Was in um, I come from London, so obviously uh, from all of that I went back into my urban environment and tried to find ways in which I could engage with uh, different spaces again. I found myself in a community centre surrounded by uh, a very new housing estate. Uh, so the, the focus of my work then switched to how I could work in that place with those people. And it was the idea that I could take whatever art form was interesting to me and the other artists and uh, the collective that we started there, and that we could use that in the context of a community that, that was living and working around us, <coughs> and how we could actually engage them, often actually in exchange for using the space inside the community centre to hone our skills and to develop our work. It was a kind of reciprocal arrangement really of how do we bring this local community together uh, and use this community centre as our as our practice space. Is it, why, why has this one company actually been so effective do you think in relation to your own experience? Well I suppose it's quite dynastic as well in that it's you know it was handed on <laughs> to Companies like mine and uh, you know, Plank, who's another company that came about about 15 years after us, um, and there was uh, other companies all, all around, mostly north of England. So we were the only ones down south for a long time. Uh, in, uh, no, I thought it was in Brighton, there was same sky. I don't know if you know that. Um, and we we were all very influenced by Welfare because they ran things like summer schools where we'd go and camp in some very wet field in Cumbria and uh, work with their artists. Mm -hmm. um, and those artists became our artists. And this tribe of artists that, that this this has gone on ever since. A kind of feeling that we're all part of the same <coughs> the same tribe, the same family, you know. And we know each other's kids who are now doing it. And so there's dynastic things happened where there's been this uh, constant exchange over the decades. Although one um, is bad as perhaps, I'm saying this kind of provocatively, as some agitprop organisations at the time, mm -hmm. but there is something about the agitprop movement that absolutely did break a mould in relation to theatre, bright colours, loud messages, clarity, uh, brilliance of message, etc., which people have adopted without necessarily holding on to the the, the, the directness of it. What do you th what do you think? Well, I think some of that directness remained with us for a while because um, emergency arts emerged at the same time that Margaret Thatcher did, and there was a very strong 
feeling, anti-Thatcherite feeling amongst this fraternity, this tribe of artists. So there was some very direct messaging during that time, supported somewhat by what was then called the GLC, the Great London Council, uh, where Ken Livingston was the big politician there, who actually funded us to do things like build Thatcher effigies and so on. So this is the early stages of working with that community I was talking about around the community centre and creating engaging kids, anybody who'd want to join in really, and tell mythical stories inspired by different traditions, sort of British traditions really at the time. Um, wanting to build things big and then burn it down. <laughs> sort of, you know, company of arsonists, I suppose. We were angry, then we start to sort of get into this idea of protest and using our art to enhance the protest. So, a great ride of the apocalypse there. This, this horseman was built by a man called Julian Crouch um, from, from Probable Theatre originally. Um, he was just a volunteer at the time, but he built this and this went to lots and lots of CMD marches, anti-apartheid marches. There was, there was a great, um, I say it in a kind of whimsical way, a great time for protests, but actually there were some very strong issues that we felt we should um, be uh, claiming. Um, and this, this, this is about different legislations, this is about the social security bill. We created a crazy golf game uh, to knock down the people who were claiming benefits, which was the idea of taking benefits away from people. Um, the previous piece of work was uh, a touring Christmas grotto that went to um, the miners, the striking miners. Um, inside that we built a, a, an alternative house and Gretel story with mm -hmm. a witch mm -hmm. in the next one who came on, uh, who again had a slightly chubby Thatcher look. Um, we took this to the miners that were striking, we took it to Green and Common, um, and this was a way of kind of giving people some support. Uh, Joy in their lives. How did young people who were raised to appreciate the idea about Christmas and gods, how did they connect up? They thought it was hilarious, particularly she farted or not, but um, that, 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 that was very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it, they, We were just finding ways in which we could engage with people who were kind of outside of the normal audience for, for the arts, really. And that was really what drove us to make work where uh, art was as accessible as education and healthcare, you know, that, it's, that it was for everybody. Um, and using these, this particular art form to make very specific, as you call it, adjective prop messages. It's funny because I'm, yeah. I'm using it like as if it's a derogatory term because it has been taken up as a derogatory term. It's like, yeah. it lacks a sophistication, but then I'm kind of interested about what happens in 68. I'm happy that you get this more professionalised art form, which seems to be more sophisticated in its levels of understanding, but perhaps at the same time loses something quite powerful in the, in, in, in the engagement, and definitely in the community engagement of participation, which strangely now is coming back into funding. Isn't it yeah. community which was like put outside as being sort of the, the bad dog is now being invited back in the game under the term participation. Okay, there's issues under that, big issues in relation to what that might mean in relation to the Arts Council, in relation to the decline in funding, the need to be sustainable, the need to engage with different communities to, 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 to stay uh, solvent. But there's something also quite interesting about it as well. Which is really yeah, well, it, but it's got, it's got in phase and waves, phases and waves, it, 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 this idea that um, the, the ordinary person can also be creative and artistic and so that. Fuse basically works within Somerset, which is a very, not a very kind of, you know, minor strike comes out country. It's, it's, a, it's a cult. It has been very uh, culturally undiverse, it's, you know, um, it's a place where Jacob Reeves Monks sells out in terms of various 
talks from the Inquis Mon, etc. But when we were invited to go into a community where they had just spent a million pounds and wasted it in an area of high social deprivation, they um, um, we were we said we're here to stay. We're not going away. We're here to stay. Most arts organisations and the way that arts funding is structured often is you fly in, you try and leave some impact, and then you fly out, and people become deeply cynical very quickly. Oh, here we go again. So that sense of engaging with the community and going through the ups and downs of those communities has actually led to a really interesting multi-stranded project which embraces community, embraces festival, embraces um, emerging young artists, which has similarity to what you're going to be talking about, I think, as well. And in relation to um, what I call transdisciplinary um, objectives, which go beyond interdisciplinary, look at bigger themes that might be with the environment. So we're working with the Quantox, um, which is a particular mountain range, and hill range in, in, in Sunset, etc. And this all started by just staying in one community and, 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 and it growing yeah. as being a very exciting yeah. um, project. And that's certainly what they did, was they were very rooted in that community. They did all their wonderful trips to Japan and Toronto and various places, but there was always this ongoing program of work in Barrow and Finesse, um, which is a very industrial town on the edge of the Lake District. And we did the same. So, you know, we started off being in, in, in that uh, housing estate in Woolwich, in South East London, um, and then we eventually settled just a bit further up the road in an old church building, which we've been in since 87. Um, and have always been working in various kind of neighbourhoods around us, whilst we are also I suppose being like the circus that blows into town in other cities and other towns. But my proviso with everybody that ever commissions us is that we work with local artists and uh, local communities who are then going to have to take some of that forward. Uh, it's not ideal um, and it's very hard to sustain anything uh, with, with the way funding works. You seldom get enough money to do more than one project. That sometimes you'll get enough money to work for three years. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's important sometimes to go somewhere to show what's possible mm -hmm. and then build on that from, from within. You're not you're a national portfolio organisation, aren't you? We are, yes. Yeah, which, which is kind of interesting because that's, that sets up a sort of structure for you that gives you some continuity and uh, and yes, it's but about, it has any drawbacks? Uh, no, it doesn't really. Uh, it's a good cushion. It's about 13% of our annual turnover. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of work. We do about 70 projects a year. Uh, we're not like uh, many arts organisations that have a, a set programme. We don't know necessarily what we're doing from year to year. Um, we are opportunistic, I don't mind saying that. We, we, we go where there's something interesting, exciting, and somebody's got some money to pay us to do it. It's very important, otherwise it wouldn't have lasted 39 years. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's all sorts of agendas behind that, and they've switched. They've, they've been very different agendas over periods of time, mm -hmm. and then it comes round again. So regeneration has been very key to that. And uh, different regenerating ones. communities, regenerating spaces, creating public artworks, creating events, and so on. Um, and now it's property developers that want to work with us. That shows up all sorts of, uh, of, of other agendas. Um, but with local authorities now having less and less uh, resources, they're being completely squeezed, they're losing most of their arts uh, funding. Um, it's, it's Section 106 money that's paying for Culture. Uh, what, what, is, what is Section 106? Section 106 um, it's probably called something different now, but it's basically all developers have to pay into uh, the local authority money that's for social. Food. Five percent of what they're using their money or whatever. It yeah, it's a percentage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And often that's used for um, community-focused work or culture, culture and arts. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in Somerset, for example, they're building Rocky Point. Uh, EDF, who have a large amount of money for 
reducing the conflict in the community. And we have to look at it and think, wow, or no. It's all about winning hearts and minds and, and trying to uh, educate those people just as much as anybody else really is to work with those developers and make them think a little bit more about how they're treating those communities, uh, the, the kind of loss that people feel quite often because they're, they're not engaged and they're not being able to use these wonderful new spaces because they're, they're private. Mm -hmm. So it's that idea that perhaps we can work with the developers to ensure that there's access to beautiful, newly built spaces for everybody. Um, that's happened around King's Cross to a certain extent. Um, so and was it Carl Lovely that basically when they could, then they cleared out part of the East End of London, he collected all the various voices, I think I don't know who it was, of the community, he then put them into the posts of, uh, because it was a motorway was being built, the family's voices, he instilled them in a pillar of the ground up the motorway. People hear those memories of those voices in, the, in that community. I think it's lovely that did that. So, yeah. uh, poetic, romantic, what I don't know. Does it does it impact? Does it mean anything? What does it do um, as a community? Well, I if they're still there, they've not been basically shut down. Well, which is not that. Into the edge of the city. So, so project response. Yeah, we did something in Glasgow once where it was uh, when they were redeveloping it in the centre of the city about to become the city of culture um, and we were asked to work there and we did two big events. One was in what was the defunct shipyard where we um, where we, we did a sort of uh, ritual, I suppose, a, a, a ritual of getting rid of things. Um, so this, this is an earlier version of it where we created a large structure that was actually a sound piece. So all this things on this structure made a sound. There was an enormous skip, rubbish skip, which became a kind of percussive instrument with people bouncing up and down with bungees inside it and thumping it. And eventually, in this one, it was a, a car that was whipped all the way to the top. This sense of, um, uh, of, of expectation, was it going to fall or not? And it ended up in the skip. Yeah, but people thought there was somebody in it, but they didn't turn. Okay. Uh, so we did the same thing in government with a ship with a boat. So it was a boat that plummeted into the into the bin. This was a sort of statement of people feeling that they had been discarded. Um, and then we also did a big parade in the middle of Glasgow where we worked with all those people who had been put into the big town blocks in the edge of the city from the inner city, and we reclaimed the squares, the, the big public squares in, in the middle of the city and had a huge party where every parcel was full of the people who'd come back into the city to say it's our square as much as it's the tourists space as well. So it, was, it was pretty, it was fun, mm -hmm. they had the biggest ice cream in the world in it and giant parcels with bagpipers in them and sound bands but it was about them being there and being kind of I suppose uh, being given permission to be there as well. So, um, I just want to show you a, another uh, beginning of a kind of activist idea. And this is working with Greenpeace for many years to make protests about specific issues uh, very visible uh, and staging these large events. We did one at the British Nuclear Fuels where everybody was dressed up as plutonium barrels and missiles and they cut their way through the fences uh, and ran towards the, uh, the process plant. And um, this was televised with the police chasing these people with plutonium barrels <laughs> running across the field. And the next one we did was um, about the dredging of the North Sea fish oils in, in order to make um, products, including biscuits. Um, so we did this kind of fish tea, and the fishies tea, and dressed everybody up as puffins because we were puffins. It's about biodiversity mm -hmm. and the compromising of the biodiversity of the North Sea. 
Um, and this did have great effect because um, international biscuits or whoever it was that owned the fittings uh, stopped using fish oil. So, so doing these kind of very visual, yeah, yeah. performative yeah, yeah. moments that catch people. So now, of course, this would be done through the internet, uh, but well, it's then it's a physical yeah. Yeah. In, piece in, of work. In Slovenia, there's a company called Lud, L-J-U-D, that, um, that the, the president of Slovenia at the time were mocking any opponents as being idiots. So they basically uh, constructed a mask of the president like an idiot. They put the plan of it onto the internet, everybody downloaded it, printed it, put it on, went into the streets. Yeah. It was fairly instrumental in his decline, mm -hmm. which was very quick soon thereafter. It can be, using the internet, just a simple idea, incredibly effective to make change using community networks that pass it on down through the system. That was our response to one of the many uh, financial crises that have happened through our lifetime, and that was a big crash in the 18th, I think. So that's the stock exchange going up in flames. But it's a local authority in Lambeth that commissioned us to do that, to make their November the 5th bonfire night of burning down the stock exchange. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and in Holcomb, where this where we're working with these kids who used to, on November the 5th, go out and burn cars. Because that, that was the best thing to do, basically, yeah. but most fun. We had fire shows mm. on November the 5th, and they all joined in on these incredible fire shows and transformed, you know, the situation within that community. And that's not just, by the way, saying, and therefore solving the problems of the council, that is also saying, absolutely putting healing in between generations that have felt absolutely ashamed of living in these communities, and, and what was happening, the older generation, who then began to see the benefits of what young people could, you know, and then pride in came into the place. And again, it's a controversial subject, what changes? Well, a lot changes, actually, in, 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 in relation to people's lives. Um, so I've called these a series of experiments, but they're just kind of, you know, d through the decades, what's, what's been the focus, and some of them have remained with us. So, I called this one building bridges, but this was um, a response, I suppose, to the migration question and the communities that live in London and us responding to that. So this is where I, I, I suppose I start to talk about um, hybridisation or cultural hybridisation, which I suppose uh, can be called also, uh, what's the word when you're Stealing somebody else's appropriation. <laughs> appropriation. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't see it that way. Um, this was about collaboration. Really. This was collaboration between uh, different artists who wanted to make a new form of music. I mean, it happens in music all the time. This, this is the, the, our street band called Crocodile Star. They met uh, a, an Indian wedding band in London, and they learned the repertoire of that Indian wedding band, and then started to. Uh, explore the idea of Bollywood film and turning that into brass band music. So the Bollywood brass band was born out of our um, street band. Um, and if you move on, we, we, we're surrounded where we are in Greenwich uh, and within Greenwich and the people I've grown up with and uh, gradually have become part of the company as well. Um, so this, this was a response really to uh, how we could create work in public spaces that represented everybody. So we started to work with uh, classical Indian dancers um, and working directly with people who wanted to create their own celebrations but the traditional skills have disappeared within the community. So it's a bit like Coles to Newcastle, we're kind of teaching people how to create their own traditions uh, but making them very public and very obviously um, uh, you know, everybody could actually enjoy these big events because they were for everybody in the community and not just for that particular group of people. Yeah, and um, so just as the equivalent, we in the West Country on a much smaller scale, we uh, uh, we auction areas. Yeah. As a community project, of, of, of orchards that have been destroyed within urban spaces, and that absolutely hits seasonal 
kind of the feelings that people have within Somerset because they still have that sense of the of the season mm -hmm. being important. So we work on intergenerational inter projects again, yeah. where the older generation remembers when there are orchards in different parts of the city, yeah. and so that replanting becomes highly symbolic and a long-term idea mm -hmm. of of engagement with the communities they work in. Sure. Well, this is with the you know that was with the the, the, the Hindu. Uh, community Association in North London, which is run mostly by a group of businessmen who have never made a paper mache rather than the Desira festival before. Um, but we worked with lots of young people there who helped us build it, that they could do it themselves next time. <laughs> um, just a big paper mache energy. Um, it's, it, interestingly, um, it isn't just within the arts section of local authorities that we've started to um, connect with. The, the uh, housing officers um, called upon us to start working on a traveller's site, which is just down the road from where we are in Abbey Wood. It's mm -hmm. the largest traveller's site, gypsy traveller's mm -hmm. site, mostly <coughs> English, Romani gypsies. Um, and there's about two or three hundred people lived on this site. It's Beautiful state, actually, when we were there. Um, and uh, I suppose by bringing in outsiders, we were the outsiders to this place of outsiders. <laughs> People felt that they were outside of society as well. And there started to be better connections. Um, and uh, because we were li we lived on the, on the site with them at various periods of time, uh, the place got cleaned up. That's what it took. Took a bunch of outsiders to come in, and all the rubbish was cleared so that we could live next door to, to them. Because um, everything was fly ticked there. I mean, they had the dust from them come on to the site, so everything was thrown into the field. And then everybody else from outside of the, the, the travel site used to throw the rubbish in there, so it was rat infested and nasty. Um, the buyers being there got cleaned up. But, then we started to work with those people and learn a lot about our own, about their culture and created pieces of work with them and for them and two of them. So uh, horses and scrap metal became a sort of scrap metal horse and uh, creating stories around their experiences, creating our own kind of community space there. Uh, and we did that for about six or seven years, wrote a book about it so that people would learn more about travel culture. And uh, the services were brought back on, uh, adult education, literacy, all that sort of thing. I'm not saying we did all that, but it's just by bringing in a, a group of people who are prepared to respond to and work with and enjoy uh, being with those people, then other people felt that they could do the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we created a very successful piece of touring work. There's an elephant there, a uh, metal elephant. We created a show called Run the Run, and for that show, we started to think more about our own diversity as a company, as a group of artists. And there we were living in London and yet everybody working for us was white, British. Um, and so by actually creating a piece of work with artists from those different different backgrounds, so we work with uh, Caribbean colonists, uh, Indian dancers, mm -hmm. um, well. And, and the Mela scene, yes, with people like Ajay Chabra and uh, started the London Mela. Um, we created this work called Runga Run, which is sort of Hindi for an easel. Or uh, well, the colour of colours, actually, which I'm going to call it. And this became a sort of tour de force, really, of, of street, street arts and performing arts on the street. It was dance, there were puppets, there were stone walkers, there was it was a bit like a, a moving festival or a mela mm -hmm. that went through the streets and then it ended up in a space where there was a kind of fight for the whole spectacle. This, the, this was in two, 2003 through to 2000 <coughs> and some later, some later stage of the 2000s. We went to about 26 different towns and cities with it, which were a large scale piece, was quite a big tour. And this is when we started to be knitted more into the Arts Council's agendas. And the Arts Council started to explore this idea of there being <coughs> an arts sector called Out of Arts. Yeah. We were one of the sort of first wave of 
companies that were seen as a kind of seven. And what sat in the, and what sat in the middle of that was, of course, two thousand and five, Selkins Elephant, which absolutely made them. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was kind of interesting because it wasn't just a big elephant that comes to London; mm -hmm. it was a big elephant that came right into Pall Mall that absolutely commented upon the actual post-imperial, post-colonial history of England, and, and asked questions about identity: who are we, and what is this big empire that is signified by? Um, the Sultan's elephant, etc. So bigger, bigger conversations that went on in relation to that, and this extraordinary fact that it was a media event, that a social media event, that ten thousand people turned up on the Friday, as you probably know the story, and they all started tweeting, basically, you've got to see this. And so by the time that the Sunday had come, there was a million people that were transformed from ten, and that's because their sense of ownership, or what they felt was a they discovered something. Yeah. But, you know, people would hear about it. There was hardly anybody there the first first day, but it went on for three, four days. Yeah. But we had an elephant before they <laughs> I um, love it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit smaller. Um, that that had a profound effect on the sort of idea that this kind of work could be acknowledged as but above from the arts practice, yeah. I suppose. Um, and the knock-on effect for us with that was that we started a programme called It Can Happen Here, which was really about, well, yes, you can create this amazing spectacle of Pong and Pong and Piccadilly, but actually you can do that in your town centre too. You can, you can have that uh, feeling that you, you're important just as much as everybody who looks things like that. So it can happen here has been the name really for our ongoing program of outdoor arts activities that engage people and sometimes involve them or sometimes we have to get for them to mark a special moment in, in the city's life. So this, this is all Rumba Rumba, the first ever human Catherine wheel. I'm very proud of that. Um, the guy who made it was the one that spins on it because. <laughs> <laughs> well, you follow it, you do it. You do it, yeah, exactly. But lots of people have done it since. And, and that's kind of, uh, it's a kind of important theme actually within outdoor arts. It is actually, as you, as you probably know, much more like um, creation centres, fact, you know, production based. Yeah. The, with, in the absence of the illusion of theatre and all the buildings, then the making of it is, is incredibly important and engaging in the process you it's more, as you know, in France, they're more like factories that operate in order to create those kind of imaginations in the absence of backdrops and sidelines and on and off. Um, and uh, there's, there, there, there's this incredible <coughs> kind of uh, skills that are actually now embedded within the, the communities that operate. Um, I don't know if you're interested, but there's a, or there just has been a shed weekend up at the 101 Centre where you can go and be shed person and start playing with objects and making stuff and sharing. You see, the emerging sets of arts is a big shed. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've got a big yard at the back which is full of sheds. And we just acquired the tire depot next door, which is an enormous shed. Mm. Um, and it's just full of people who love to make contraptions. Mm. You know, mm. People who, with small children, took things apart and mm. tried to find out how to build it back together. We have and, what's all special, <laughs> and what's there all specialist within? To us, it's also an incredible kind of you've got to do it yourself yeah. attitude yeah. towards working. Yeah. So, since I've started doing it, I've actually become competent from being somebody who's completely incompetent in many different areas. And that's well, that kind of a wonderful too. impact and skill, which then gets passed on into community practices, etc. So, that sense of self enablement is, is an important aspect of this work. So, that often parades are associated with community engagement, which go into sort of areas. Mm -hmm. Does leave a very, very strong uh, set of skills. Yeah. Yeah, so and I suppose anybody who walks into an art building as an artist who may well be a practitioner of one art form is often asked to <laughs> work in another one. Mm. So quite a lot of our makers end up as performers as well in the shows, like this guy, um, who's at the car camp originally. Um, outdoor arts becoming a sector, becoming anything from uh, projected spectacles or video mapping now, this is done with slides um, on the castle, on Warwick Castle. Um, 
creating con a kind of concert vibe in a public park. Our puppets aren't willow anymore, they're sort of mechanical contraptions. Um, using um, imagery for campaigns, this is recycling campaigns for a local authority, so this robot's made out of wheelie bins. And we've used this robot ever since for all sorts of things. There's something about being um, a, a company of long standing, which is that we decided about 10 years ago to have our own kind of wing of younger people, younger artists. And some of that was done through uh, the idea of a, which was a bit tied in with the Olympics as well, um, which was about training young people up to be performers, uh, outdoor arts practitioners, starting at quite an early age as an alternative to the youth theatre. Um, but uh, we also started to work more with uh, 18 to 25 year olds and how we could create the skills needed to be producers uh, in the arts in general really. We weren't hardly all off into our own way of working. But, um, and uh, we created a project called TOWI, The Only Way is Ethics, um, which is obviously based on a popular TV programme. Um, but we were working with Bishopsgate Institute to engage in a group of very diverse young people. Some perhaps had a bit of further education, some hadn't. Um, and helping them to see how there was a future both in the arts and in the heritage industry. Mm -hmm. And using arts practice to make the heritage industry more, um, more popular. Because lots of young people don't go to museums. They do with their kids because school takes them and the parents take them, but when you get into your teens, am I, is that true, do you think? This, this is what we found anyway. Which resonates with me in relation to Bunning Street Arts, we've been on Bunning Street Arts for so long. Yeah. Where does this kind of education sit in terms of Kansas University? Mm -hmm. Does it sit somewhere mm -hmm. between practice-based, um, uh, a, a practice, practical practice-based, mm -hmm. um, a university degree traditionally leads towards a kind of management status where there isn't necessarily a clear management status within the street arts per se. Are you just training people to be producers? Is that it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas the making, uh, this is not possible to build a making facility within the university very easily, even not an art school, etc. So there's, there are lots of problems and contradictions about trying to situate a degree which actually potentially was very academic in relation to the definition of place and site and in relation to ar 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 architecture, archaeology, you know, architecture. Many subjects came into it, but by, um, but by not being able to, to lock it down, in a, in a, in a way you fill, this, you fill this quite important gap for the 18 to 25 year old. You know, yeah. group. But they're, they're, not university. And may not want to go to university, yeah. may not want to travel through £9,000 a year to a place which is not guaranteed in any sense of, of being. Where do you deliver? And this is a subject for performing arts generally, as we know, that this particular moment is a key issue about what is it that we're trying to do. I anyway, we'll wonder for that vision, but it's kind of relevant to what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's a sort of uh, informal form of training and education, but very practically based um, and inspired by collections and archives in museums. Let's talk about paint the piece. As, as, yes, a, as, as a response to the 1418 now uh, commemorations of uh, artistic commemorative events for World War One, uh, we were invited to come up with an idea ourselves for that uh, for 2018 and we decided to look at the idea of Peace and what does peace um, feel like, and what was what was won from this momentous war? So we didn't actually get the funding for 1418 now, but we raised our own money from Arts Council England and the Heritage Lottery Fund to launch the project last uh, November, just the day after Armistice Day, with a peace poem or a peace statement. So. Um, Artist Robert Montgomery, who kind of uses the, the the context of public art almost as advertising, illuminated pieces of work 
or billboards and so on to make a, a statement so that a hundred years of the dream never ends. And the idea is that we want to now take people on a journey for the whole of this year, including a group of young producers in four cities, um, and work with them to create other artworks that respond to the idea of the, the, the profound impact of like, peacemaking and peace building, and researching that with the Peace Museum in Bradford, which I think is the only peace museum in this country, um, and looking at other ways in which people are building peace, uh, important people who are heroes of peace and so on. And then November 2019, we will have six artworks created in those cities and our giant poem, which toured to each of those cities in November. And, um, and make new work and events that are celebrating peace. What we'd like to do, I've, we've got other things we, we would like to talk about, of course, is a massive subject, but there are certain companies that I think are really interesting, which I will pitch, I will put links into the publication. Um, companies like Tilted, for example, um, that use at the centre migration as being a kind of a key inspiration to interdisciplinary work. Um, and Kamchatka, who work brilliantly in all sorts of different parts of the, of the world, etc. And we will pitch those up as continuations and developments of artistic models and practices which are, are diverse and different from this, but in some way carry some of the inspiration within the centre of what they do. Thank you for coming, and thank you very much, Debs, for being here today. Pleasure. Yeah. Well, I hope it was a